I sat down to write the words. We live in a time when we don't wait for anything, when everything moves fast, there's many distractions, and my cell phone beeped at me as I started writing those words. And so I turned the darn thing off, and I got sat down to finish writing the introduction to this sermon, which is, we live in a time and a culture which doesn't wait for things. You, do, who here has, had, has thought, I, I'll wait and make that phone call when I get home? You make it right away, don't you? Because you got cell phones. Or who, uh, who waits to watch TV until 7 o'clock when the show comes on? You're the exception, short guys, because most people get Netflix. Your parents don't have Netflix. You are deprived children. You'll, you'll survive. <laughs> you, don't have, you, don't have, you don't have to get up and walk up to adjust the volume like they used to. They used to not have remote controls. I know, crazy. Right, uh, we don't live in a time when you have to wait. And we don't, uh, we don't wait for our food either. Our food is fast food. And the, our fast food is driven by that most amazing of modern conveniences, the microwave. Now, I love my microwave, but there are limitations to the microwave. I also love corned beef. Can you make corned beef in the microwave? Can you imagine what that looked like when it came out? Just slap that corned beef in the microwave for eight hours and... <laughs> if you're going to make corned beef, what do you got to do? You got to put that in a crock pot with the brine and the sauces and, and the salt and all the, the seasonings, and you just got to turn it on low and you got to forget about it. You got to let it take its time. If you're going to make corned beef, it's going to take a while. It's going to be slow, but it's going to be worth it. Because there is nothing better when you put that big old hunk of corned beef on your plate, so tender you don't need. If you need a knife to to make corned beef, you've done it wrong. And uh, it's just oh, it's so good with a good sauce made with the juice and a little bit of mustard and horseradish. It takes a while to make good food. There's a movement that began in 1986 called the slow food movement. It's uh, started in Italy, which is fitting. But the slow food movement uh, believes in regional cuisine, seasonal. There are times of years when you're not going to have fresh fruit because it's, it's not when it's ripe. It's a regional cuisine, seasonal eating, sustainable food, local businesses. But above all else, the slow food movement was a reminder that good food takes a while. It just simply does. You can't go fast to get good food. I, I, this is a movement I hope we can all support, and one of the ways we do that is by having gardens. Now, gardens have all gone in. Who here, is, who here planted their garden already? Some people, a few gardens out there. Good. I love gardens. The problem with gardening is first you've got to be able to get something to grow out of the ground. That's not the hard part. The harder part is the, the weeding. I hate weeding. I despise weeding. I can never, there's a rhythm to reading, weeding, right? You've got to get in there often enough that, that it doesn't overtake the garden, but not, if you get in there so often, then you just hate it. So I mean, there's, it's a challenge. It takes time to grow slow food, but the weeding, ugh. Today we gather around the event called Pentecost. It's an event that begins fast. It's an event that begins with the Holy Spirit rushing into a room and, and the people who are gathered, followers of Jesus, then they rush out into the street and they're out in the street and they're talking to people and everyone's excited because they're speaking in languages they have not heard before and people are hearing in their, their own languages. And it's, it's a big, fast movement. A lot of people rushing out at once and people are questioning, what is going on? Are they drunk? Well, it's nine in the morning. They're probably not. But what is going on here? And it's already in the middle of the rush of the, of the holy days, because they're there for the, the uh, Pentecost, well, it wasn't called Pentecost, it's the harvest feast a after Passover, but everyone is there, and it's exciting, and, and I think we need to realize that that slows, slows down really fast, because what happens, if I walk up to someone I've never met before, and we're excited that we can communicate, I mean, even more excited because we don't speak the same language, what happens next? Excellent. We can talk. Let's sit down and talk. And can you talk and can you listen fast? Right? Can, can, you, can you listen and understand someone in a hurry? Imagine what that'd be like. You rush out onto the street and you're talking to people you've never talked before, people from all across the known world, and you find this interesting Egyptian fellow and you want to sit down and listen because, wow, you're from... Tell me about... 
And then you pour a cup of coffee, and, but you'll pour, you tell them, I'm only going to pour a quarter cup because I want to listen to you fast. Right? I want you to be fast. I want you to tell everything there is to know about your culture. But I want you to do it in a quarter cup of coffee. And I'm going to tell you about the most important person you'll ever know about, Jesus Christ. But a quarter cup of coffee, we're going to do this fast. Right? It wouldn't work. Pentecost starts fast, and then it slows down to the speed of a cup of coffee. Because you can't hurry. You can't listen in a hurry. To understand folks, to explain yourself, it takes time. I think the fast start of Pentecost then leads quickly into the, the slow work of the Spirit. Pentecost marks the fast start of the church, but then things slow down. Right? It's like planting strawberries. You plant strawberries, and there are a few moments of excitement. I mean, when the, the plants first burst out of the ground, the first flower, maybe the first uh, time you see fruit. But otherwise, they're really... It, Watching strawberries grow is not exciting. Right? It takes time. When does a strawberry get ripe? It's not like you're counting. It just takes as long as it takes. It's a slow process. I believe it's the same thing with the work of the Holy Spirit. As we turn to the Spirit, inviting God into our lives daily, choosing again and again to follow Jesus, doing what he did, gathering in his name, if we're looking to grow the fruit of the Holy Spirit, to be ripened, so to speak, to, to weed out that which does not belong in our lives, it's going to take a while. It's slow work, the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is to reveal the Son to us, to help us to know Jesus better. Any inclination or desire or hunger or curiosity we have towards Jesus is the Holy Spirit at work in us. Any prayer, no matter how half-hearted, any stumble towards the footsteps of Jesus, no matter how confused. No, any move towards faithfulness is due to the work of the Spirit of God seeking us and turning us and guiding us. The Holy Spirit is what points towards Jesus, advocating on Jesus' behalf. As we respond and accept this, we end up growing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is what grows from following Jesus, and that's what we have read about earlier today. We read about the fruit, and the fruit, uh, the literal translation is to say it is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But I like the way that uh, Eugene Peterson, in the translation of the Bible called the message, he, he expands upon that. And here's how he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. What happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what works over time as the Spirit moves in us and directs us towards Jesus, the one whom we follow. It doesn't happen naturally either. Right? That is not some, that's not fruit that's just going to happen by itself. Anyone ever look out your backyard and you get surprised by all of a sudden you've got a garden back there? Right? Anyone have any surprise gardens grow up? No. You have a garden because you meant to grow a garden. It is the same way with the work of the Spirit. It doesn't, the fruit of the Spirit doesn't just happen naturally. It happens because we are guided by the Spirit and we are following Jesus, following behind Him. And, and if that's the fruit of the Spirit, that way of living, what's the weeds? Well, what are the weeds? The weeds are the, the, the acts of the flesh, which is, as Paul describes, it's not that flesh is intrinsically wrong or bad. It's that if we give in to our natural inclinations, what are we going to end up with? If we give in to our natural inclinations, what Paul points out we're going to end up with is sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. But again, Eugene Peterson puts a little bit more meat on it, and I like how he puts it. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. And that's the way of the flesh, right? Trying to get your own way all the time, putting yourself first. Try to get your own way all the time, and you'll get repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. 
frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, which is basically every commercial you ever see. Here, buy this, it'll make you happy until you see the next commercial. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods, magic show religions, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a, into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. Now that, that's the weeds. That, that's what's growing up. That's the weeds that need to be pulled. This is what happens when we focus on ourselves and our ways and what comes naturally. The desire to grow the fruit of the Spirit, the need to weed the acts of the flesh out of our lives is what brings us together in worship. It's the most important hour of the week. It's the time to heed the call of the Spirit to be directed towards Jesus, the one who sends the advocate, the comforter. That's why the Holy Spirit is named sometimes the comforter. Here's the thing about the Holy Spirit being named the comforter. It gives us the impression that it will always be comforting us. The Holy Spirit will always be comforting you and me. You see, sometimes the Holy Spirit comforts you with the fruit of following Jesus, but sometimes there's weeding to be done. Sometimes there's weeding to be done to do something about those uh, the idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and discord. And so sometimes the Holy Spirit is the one who comforts you, and sometimes the Holy Spirit is the one who comforts your neighbor who's tired of putting up with your weeds. Sometimes we need to be weeded, and the Holy Spirit's comforting our neighbor who is tired of that overgrowth that they've had to put up with. Holy Spirit's always, always comforting. I believe in the fruit of the Spirit, the slow work of gardening, right? To grow fruit, to do the weeding, it takes time. I know it takes time because of this. These are my prayers for over a decade. I, I get up in the morning and I write. And uh, this is the book from 1228-2001 to 624-2002, right? And so uh, you can see eventually I, start, I stopped using spiral bound. It takes up too much space. And I realized I was in this for the long haul. Uh, and I, I've been reading through these recently because it's a time of transition. We're packing. And I had to pick what are the things I'm going to keep out that no one else is going to touch and I'm going to move myself. And this is one of those things. No one else touches these. These are my prayers and they are sacred to me. They are holy. And as I'm looking through them, I can't find the point at which I went from being afraid of what would be next to trusting that it is in God's hands. I can't find the, the page in there at which I went from saying, God help me in spite of the church, to I trust you in the church. I can't find the point in there in which I went from being terrified from, of being a parent to being rejoicing to be a parent. I found the page at which we were scared of having a kid, but I can't find the page at which we said, ah, here it is, and, and it just has become part of my prayers for, for my children. Trying to find the point in here at which I changed from who I was to who I am is impossible. It's as impossible as trying to figure out the point at which a strawberry is ripe. You, you don't know. It, 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 gets, it gets ripe when it gets ripe. I am certain, though, that if I am ripe with any of the fruit of the Spirit, it is because of this, it is because of worship with you, it is because of service to others, it is because I have followed the leadings of the Spirit. If there is any ripeness to my life, it's in there, and I can't narrate exactly how or when it happened, but it did. And if you want a glimpse of what this looks like, some of you know Jean Heeman over at Green City. She's got a place out at Greencastle. And if you walk into her house and you sit down at her table and look to your left, you're going to look out a big bay window, and right in front of the window is her strawberry patch. And that strawberry patch is amazing. And here's what makes it so amazing. Every bit of the strawberry patch is full of strawberries. There is not a single space for any weed in there. That's where we're headed. We're headed towards a life in which our lives are so full of through the Spirit, there just isn't any room for the weeds. It's a beautiful thing to see Gene's strawberry patch. 
It's an even more beautiful thing to see people's lives when the fruit of the Spirit is full and they live that joy and that peace and that love. That is our destination. That is our purpose. To live lives guided by the Holy Spirit such that in the end we know nothing but the fruit of the Spirit. Following Christ in love and joy and peace this day and forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.